Okay, we're recording. Okay. Welcome, everybody. We're going to talk a little bit about the St. Martin of Tour, and he it's T O U R S. Oftentimes it's pronounced Tour or Tours in the French. So I'm not sure which is accurate. I've heard it both, both ways, but I've actually been to Tour. It's a wonderful place. And we have, of course, our icon uh, blessed a couple of days ago. We had our great Martin Mass. And today we're going to talk a little bit about this individual, this famed confessor of the love saint. There's a saying uh, from a fellow by the name of Fortune Office who lived in the 6th century. He said, wherever Christ is known, Martin is honored. And we just have a, we have a sense from antiquity that Martin was just so beloved. And I want, if I can convey anything to you all, that's what I want to convey. Uh, just how important he is to our tradition. And that he was to our ancestors of the faith. There were over 400 towns in France alone that are dedicated to him. In the 19th century, there were 3,678 parishes in France that were dedicated to him. And now a lot of them, you know, they've closed and burned, and a lot of them are burning these days. But I mean, that's an incredible number of parishes. Um, not just France, 163 parishes in the British Isles, six of them in London, 73 parishes in Holland, 239 in Flanders, over 100 in Hungary, 120 in former Yugoslavia, many more in the rest of Europe. So, who is this man? O oh, Martin, who mass wind, wind will thou blow, and shake the green leaves off the trees. It's that time of year where it gets cold and the leaves start to turn the turn colors and you see more leaves on the ground than on the trees. Today we're going to be talking about Martin. I'm giving you a sense of who, the sources that I've used here. And um, this is a French lady who is a um, great um, many of us. And uh, I'm using her source on the same part. She's deceased now, but wonderful. She also wrote a book called Those Temple Middle Ages. It's hilarious. But we need to see, start from the beginning, since St. Martin was uh, born in Pannonia. And I'm not even going to try to pronounce the, the Hungarian name of the city. Uh, somebody did. Anyway, you see it there. And um, we, have, we want to understand a little bit about his early life. By the way, this is where we're going to be going, on our, one of the places we're going to be going on our pilgrimage when we go to Europe this summer. In Gaul, Martin was free um, to do as he wished. Um, but when he was in this part of Hungary, he was a young lad and very, and his parents were, were pagans. And so he, they were stationed uh, in this part of, of the empire. And that's where he was born. So he was. Roman, but he wasn't born in Rome. He was part of the empire. And his father was a military man. And at the time, um, if your father was in the military, that meant you had to go into the military. So he was later raised in basically um, Pavia, what we call Pavia. Uh, and it was uh, near Milan and he is, uh, so he spent a few years of his childhood in Hungary, and then he kind of grew up, um, but still a very young man in what, it, what we think of as Northern Italy. And he was a young man in this 107, and he became a cab Cuban at this time. And you have to keep in mind that this is right on the cusp of when the church is becoming legal, right? So the Edict of Milan, you know, is right about now, and you've got sort of this real moment in history. So his parents remain pagan, his father uh, is uh, very pagan, 
but he himself chooses, as a young man, to become a catechumen. At 10 years old, he began attending the Christian church, and that was in the year 327, so just like 10 years after the Edict of Milan. And he became a catechumen, even though his parents were pagan, and five years later, at 15 years of age, he was drafted into the army. So you get a sense of, like, he's a catechumen, not yet baptized, right? His parents were pagan, so he has a, a lot of freedom. And then he's drafted into the army at 15. And it was three years later when he was in Amiens, where he has the moment of his conversion, where he has the famous cloak, and we'll talk about that. But one of the things I think is important for us to reflect upon is that Martin is, you know, we think of him as an old man, and he was when he died. But a lot of his sort of, his young life was very important. His conversion as young man. A lot of the events that we think of most about him actually occurred when he was not even 20. So the Edict of Milan is 315, and Martin was born in 317. And the Council of Nicaea against Arianism was in 325. He would have just been 10 years old. So he would have been a catechumen right at the time when the church was right of all this struggle between the Catholic orthodoxy and the Arianism, which was the heresy. And that is something that kind of defined a little bit St. Martin because most of the bishops ended up being heretics. So when you were seeking to become Catholic and you knew the difference between Arianism and Catholicism, where do you go? And so that, that's a sort of a big moment, a big sort of a motivation in his life is to how do I find a, a real Catholic in a world that's so f full of heretics, right? So Arius, who started Arianism, dies in Constantinople in 336, and then Constantine dies in 337. Um, and he was baptized by a semi arian bishop of Constantinople. And in 361, Constantius II closed the pagan temples and made pagan rites punishable by death. And he was baptized by his father, owned by the Seminarian Bishop. And Martin was baptized in the year 354. And then almost immediately, Julian the Apostate becomes, uh, becomes the emperor. So you've got this sort of, we're, we're moving along towards Christianity. There's this heresy, but we're sort of navigating through this true Christianity. And you, know, you get baptized, and you think, all is well. And then the emperor becomes a heretic. And what do you do? Because you're in the military. How do you fight for this man who wants to basically kill the Catholics, right? So what do you do? Okay, um, that gives us a sense of his, uh, his situation in life, where he fits in into history. Here's this great painting of St. Nicholas slapping Arius there at the Council of Nicaea. In the year 397, Rome will be sacked like 13 years later. So he's at a kind of a cusp of history. He's really sort of on this sort of edge of where things were beginning to super change. And one of the things we need to understand about barbarians, and we have the great barbarians uh, on our Martin house, they were dressed as barbarians, which was accurate. However, also, the Arab, the, the barbarians were not all of them even. Some of them were Arians. The barbarians were Arians, right? So some of them were heretics. And so Martin was negotiating between some who had never received the gospel and some who had received the gospel that was incorrect or incomplete. So that, again, it made his life very interesting. As a, as a bishop, as a, an, an evangelist. So the Goths, um, the Huns drove the Goths into the empire beyond the Danube. The Goths were rising up and soon they would migrate westward. 
the Ostrogoths, the Visigoths, and the Vandals were all Aryans, unlike the Germanic tribes who were Catholic, that is, the Franks and the Lombards. And so you've got this big political, geopolitical, religious sort of conflict happening. The old, this is a Visigothic church in Spain. And it's an Aryan church, it's now, of course, Catholic. Um, one of the things that is happening in the East, in um, northern Africa, is you have Athanasius. And he is sort of struggling against Arianism and the and the emperors of the East tend towards Arianism. So they tend to either to sort of kick Athanasius out. So it's not only is it a persistent heresy, Arianism, in the church, it also has something of a public, you know, sort of stamp of approval by, by the Christian emperors of the East. So how do you struggle against that? And Athanasius is one of those who does, but Martin is one who does, but also he finds out an ally in Hillary of Poitiers. This is the Via Santi Martini, just gives you a sense of the pilgrimage routes in Europe that you can take to find parts of his life, places where he lived, and uh, shrines where he's honored. So he was new to the army, he was only 18, but then something happened. Um, Martin was a Roman soldier who converted fully, again, to Christianity, because he had already been a catechumen. And after an encounter with a half-naked beggar at the gate of the city of Amiens, and he cut his cloak in half in order to share it with the beggar, and that night Christ appears to him in a dream or vision reveal himself. This experience encouraged Martin to renounce the army and to become a soldier for Christ. And he began, he founded what was a hermitage and began the first monastery in the West. He was the father of monasticism in the West. And this is all taking place in, in Gaul, what we call France. In art, the cape is always red, but in reality, I'm told it was white. Central to St. Martin's cult is this relic of the remaining half of the cloak, and it was deemed to be so important that kings of France used it as a royal banner in the war. They swore oaths upon it. And the structure where the half cloak was preserved was for, referred to as the the capella or the chapel, the little cloak. So the chapel, the capella, the little cloak, became the name for the place where it was, the chapel. But it also became the name for the chapel, the, the priest in the army who carried and protected the relic. So we get our word chapel and our word chaplain from this cape. Legendary St. Martin's cloak. I can find no anything about where it is now. I'm assuming it's just disappeared over the time. You know, it was a, probably turned to dust, was lost in battle, burned in whatever. But it was such an important relic for so many, many, many centuries. So again, at 18, he served in the military uh, for another two years, but he ultimately ended up becoming baptized. And where do you find somebody to baptize you when all the bishops and priests are buried, right? So that was not always an easy question as well. <coughs> he was baptized, and he began his life as a Catholic. Now, in the heretical times, St. Martin found an ally, as I said before, in Hilary of Poitiers. Martin was 
scandalized by the schisms and the heresies in the Christian church. And so he became a disciple of Hillary, who was like Athanasius, but in the West. He was this, this strong component, a strong um, defender of Catholicism, and a uh, strong you know, critic of opponents of Catholicism. So much so that he, too, was oftentimes sent into exile, Hillary de Poitiers. He's the reason, by the way, we have our gloria that we sing on Sunday mornings. Because he went to the East and they were seeing it there and he brought it back to the West after he was exiled. So Hillary Poitier was just this really tremendous sort of figure. And he was someone that, a father figure for Martin, somebody that Martin could trust to convey to him the faith as a Catholic. And Hillary became a kind of patron to, to St. Martin. So when St. Martin said, I want to bring monasticism from Egypt, and I want to plant it in Gaul, Hillary said, we can work with that, right? So he was kind of a patron for St. Martin. And originally, the idea was, Martin was going to live as a hermit, a solitary life. But what ultimately ends up happening almost every time is you've got one holy guy or lady who says, I'm going to go live by myself because the world is crazy and I want to get to heaven. And then people start coming. Right? And so you, you have this, this event that occurs in the middle of nowhere and then suddenly you have a city around which, you know, it's around this holy person. And so with Western monasticism, it began as this idea of being a hermit all by oneself, and yet it, it evolves into being a community of people who are trying to live in a monastic way. And, you know, he was already a soldier, so he already had a lot of discipline in his own life, and so that, I think, that harsher, more aromatic, sort of hermetical life made a lot of sense to him. And here's the thing, Catholicism was an urban reality, right? Um, so you had a bishop, and you had the priest, and you had parishes, and they would have been in the major old Roman cities. But beyond that, out in the countryside, it was still pretty pagan. And here was a man who wanted to go live in the country, right, to live by himself. And so that began, again, it was like an opportunity that the Lord uses to begin to convert those who are living outside of the cities. But as the case may be, you know, when you're a really holy guy, somebody wants to make you a bishop. And sometimes. And um, with Martin, he did not want to be a bishop. Uh, and there's a great story where he, so he, where the people were like, we're going to make Martin our bishop. And he ran into a barn and hid. And suddenly there was a bunch of geese and they all made this great noise. And so they found Martin. I don't know if it's true or not, but it's a great story. So you see a lot of times geese uh, associated with St. Martin because of that story. And he is appointed the Bishop of Tours. And there's already a cathedral there, and he becomes their bishop. And he never stops thinking about those people beyond the walls. How do we begin to evangelize those people beyond the walls? And these were tough people. I mean, they were, these were people who like, came at him with axes. Right? But he still had a sort of love for those, uh, the unchosen, the unwashed, the, you know, the, the, the barbarian beyond the wall. Which I think is why so many people are so devoted to it, because so many of our ancestors probably weren't in the big cities, right? They were country folk. He was a ceaseless traveler. He traveled a great deal. And he would take the Roman roads, but, and here's the big difference, you know, the Roman roads were great, and they went from city to city, but he would take 
the pagan paths, the woods, the paths through the woods, the dirt roads, uh, the gall and the gallish pathways. And in so doing, he would find people off the pagan path, the Celts, the pagans, the Pagi, and the remote people, who were by and large animists. Sometimes they worshipped trees or woodland dwellers, rural folk. And he would build monasteries out of these areas. And so they would become a, a source of evangelization in remote places. Martin organized the parish system of the church that we call, and we call this a parish, that's Martin's idea. And um, the word parochia is a Greek word which means a house to dwell in. And so this is where one of the monks or priests would dwell, right? So that he could be present to the people of God in these villages. And Martin continued to try to live as a monk. Uh, you know, he, he was a bishop, but he continued to try to live very um, simply. But there was this one great story in, um, this is the Owl of Valentina, or the Basilica of Constantine in Trier. And it was a palace in the early Christian structure it was built around the year 310, and um, there were Gnostics who were coming up in the church, and the, the emperor of the East was really dead set against the Gnostics. He wanted to, to nip that in the bud. He wanted to basically wipe them out. And Martin went to Trier and basically said, you can't kill somebody because they're a heretic. And we want to convert them. And so Martin would actually stand up to bishop to emperors successfully and, uh, and argue for the case of conscience, right? The freedom of religion. Even though he was a zealous in his love for the Lord and his, and his love for Catholicism, and even though he was living at a time of heresies, he, he was also respectful of those who were not of his same thinking. Um, there are great stories of how he began to sort of win over the barbarians. He's famed uh, for battling demons. There's uh, whole stories about how he raised three people from the dead. And um, he would push down idols. He would, you know, you know, as, as sort of respectful as he was of your conscience, he had, you know, he had a real sense that he was battling demons with these fake, false gods. And so he had a lot of courage there. There's um, a great story of him, which we'll talk about in this next slide, where he goes to this village. And, you know, they're worshiping this tree. And the tree, you know, maybe they've had human sacrifices on the tree. And it's a very old tree. And uh, Martin just says, okay, you know, this tree needs to be cut down. We need to build a church here. And they say, well, you let us cut it down. He says, okay. And they say, you stand right over there. And we're going to cut the tree down. And so they're cutting the tree down. And Martin's standing there. And they're cutting it in such a way that they know it's going to fall and kill them. But he says a little prayer and the tree falls the other way. So he just was a man of many miracles. And, uh, and the and the pagans were terribly impressed with these miracles. The healings, you know, I mean, in a sense he was such an apostle, but almost like a Christ figure up or above the Alps, right? On the other side of the Alps. He was somebody who really brought hope and uh, and uh, New message. But oftentimes, what they would do is they would tear the trees down and cut them up and turn them into the church, right? Build the rafters with the trees. So, his tomb becomes um, 
very important in Europe. It's one of the more visited shrines in Europe uh, for many centuries. Uh, it was on the road to Santiago. I mean, I think in some ways St. Martin may have even been bigger than St. St. James at some point in the sort of hearts of people, because St. James was kind of, they found that a little later, right? Martin was early. I mean, in a sense, you know, when you would go, um, if you lived in Ireland, or if you lived in Scotland, or if you lived in England, or if you lived in France, you know, it was almost impossible to get to the Holy Land or to Rome. And you needed a place of pilgrimage because Christians, we, we like our pilgrimages, right? And, and in a time before there were jails and prisons, you know, the priest might say to you, if you've murdered someone, you need to get out of these reporters. Why don't you do a pilgrimage to, to Rome? And, you know, if you did that and came back, then that was considered, okay, you've done your penance. But uh, people were not going to just stand for you to just hang out in town after you murdered people. So pilgrimages were places to make for the pious, but also for those who were seeking, you know, a kind of conversion. And sometimes it was given to them as a penance, but oftentimes it was also chosen. But tour became just a great place for pilgrimage. And a lot of them, um, the kings would marry queens, and then the kings would die in battle, and oftentimes the queens would come to tour, and they would, you know, have a, they would start an abbey or a monastery. So, you know, the idea was to pray before the, the tomb of St. Martin. And so there was a royal cult that kind of pulled, you know, that sort of developed around St. Martin. So this is an example of what the, the great basilica in Tour looked like before the French Revolution. No other place other than St. Peter's in Rome had, was more important for pilgrims. And, it, and it, like I say, it had eventually even eclipsed Santiago to come and sell. And people just would come from, from miles and miles to pray and tour. But the French Revolution was a godless thing, and so they put roads in the middle of the church and they destroyed the church. And so it took about 200 years after that before a new church was built smaller and before a new tomb was set. So the tomb had been lost, but it was later recovered. Uh, and again, you know, it's just a terrible tragedy of the French Revolution. People say, you know, happy Bastille days and good things. Anyway, St. Martin is the glory of God, not the French Revolution. Just to give you a sense of how important he is, this is Monte Cassino. Monte Cassino is the, the place that St. Benedict, who was the great um, monk and the founder of the Benedictine Order, who went up to this crazy mountain to be alone, and of course all these men followed him, and he started a mess. And he died there, you can go and see his grave there. His sister's grave is there in St. Scholastica. But the church that he built there, on top of that mountain above the clouds, which is now just in the, it's ruined, but was dedicated to St. Martin. Right? So Martin was the first to bring monasticism to the West, but Benedict was hit kind of his disciple, and Benedict is the one who sort of commercialized, if you will, made more broadly um, attractive the notion of monasticism. He put order to it. And I don't know if any of you know Benedictines, but their history is so important in the evangelization of Europe um, because they were following Martin's pattern of 
going out in the middle of nowhere and establishing a place to live. And ultimately, it became a school, it became a hospital, it became a, a university, it became a city, it became a town. People began to move there. And so, but it was a, an instrument for evangelization. And the, the Benedictines were following the model of St. Martin. And so every abbey you go into, I can't think of no exception. Almost every abbey you go into, if they have St. Martin's windows, one of them will be of St. Martin. Again, to impress upon you the antiquity of this, of the devotion to St. Martin, this is the Candida Casa in Whitmore. This is the oldest church in Scotland. And it was built by St. Ninian, and he died in the year 432, and he dedicated it to St. Martin. St. Patrick is said to have studied in Tour, probably knew Patrick, uh, knew Martin, and is even considered uh, the, the nephew of of St. Patrick. So there's a familial connection between Martin and Patrick. Again, I'm not here to tell you that's true or not. I can't look at the cheap DNA, but that that history is said, that that tradition is held, gives us a sense of how important Martin was. Because we think of Patrick as the great St. Patrick, and yet he loved and had a devotion to the St. Martin. This is the holy island of Iona, off the coast of Scotland, Scotland and the, between Scotland and Northern Ireland, and what was then the Dalriata Kingdom. And um, this is the abbey that was built by St. Columba, where St. Columba was buried and all the early kings of Dalriata. And of course, the Protestant Reformation really did not cover all the crosses, but one of the crosses that remains and that still stands is the earliest cross, which is dedicated to St. Martin. This is the oldest church in England. It's in Canterbury. It's where King, uh, Queen Bertha would hear mass and where her husband, Ethelbert, the pagan, um, invited the Benedictines to come over after she had been there for many years to begin a, to found a, um, an abbey in Canterbury. But, the, but before they got there, and before the Benedictines were even formed, this is the oldest church in England and it's dedicated to St. Saint Martin. It's a sweet little thing, it's a Protestant thing these days, but it's very sweet. And um, so I can't see a mass there, but too bad. Um, so this is the Abbey and Murray, and there are so many abbeys that are dedicated to him. Again, because he was the father of Western monasticism. But one of the reasons I put this up is because the Habsburgs are buried here. That's where they're in was traditionally. And so a lot of these royal families have a great devotion to St. Martin. So in the painting in our church of Carl and Zita, Carl is buried in Portugal, Zita is buried in Austria, but their hearts are buried together in this abbey of St. Martin. For many years, the feast day was the Holy Day of Obligation, and it was, Martin was to the west, what St. Nicholas was to, is to the east, and um, he actually died on the 8th, but he was buried on the 11th, and there were such huge crowds that they made that his feast day. And there were multiple feasts, by the way, on the calendar for Martin. We've reduced it only back to the first original. But, you know, for years it was so important that it would get multiple, multiple feasts. 
We just had our Martin Mass. We know a little bit about that. You serve keys, you can get and it's a, you have your candle, uh, your lantern procession. It's just a lot of fun. But all of this wonderful tradition is coming from our ancestors. And if you have a Indian summer, we call it, uh, in Europe, it's typically we call the St. Martin summer, which is you know when it should be getting cold and it gets a little warm. Uh, then they'll call it St. Martin summer. Um, the harvest, it's a time, it's a harvest festival in the church's history. It's also a time to bless the new wines. It would be a time in, uh, in almost all European uh, countries where the new wines would just be made available on or around the Feast of St. Martin, even today. And so, you know, that's always a, you know, when you're living in Rome and the new wines come out, it's like, you know, it's just a happy time because you get to taste all the new wine. <laughs> and, uh, but a lot of times, uh, the, 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 the wineries and uh, they'll, the vineyards and the wineries, they'll, uh, they'll have somebody dress up like St. Martin and come in and bless the wine on St. Martin's Day. Huge day throughout the world and um, just a lot of celebrations in um, and uh, he kind of, he's as important in Germany as he is in France. I think one of the reasons maybe why November the 11th was chosen as Armistice Day is because he was somebody that both sides could sort of have an equal devotion to, right? So World War I ends on the 11th hour of the 11th day. So, of the 11th month, St. Martin's. And there's all these lovely processions of candles. And this again is just to give you a sense of the cape and how it was used even by the, the Gaul uh, the soldiers and the kings, the Merovingians, the Carolingians, they would carry it in, 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 into battle. And we heard that he's taken the faster, which is a hymn that was written in the 10th century um, at this last mass, and that's written for St. Martin as well. Next, I'm going to take you a little bit to a place called Ravenna. Have they been there? Is it Ravenna? No. Ravenna is um, in northern Italy. And you have to understand that Rome was the imperial capital from historically. But when things became hot with fighting off barbarians and, and invasions and whatnot, you know, the capital would kind of move with the emperor. So if the emperor was fighting in Gaul or if the emperor was fighting in the, on the Danube or whatever, you know, he would move and the apparatus of the government would move because the military would move. So there were capitals, plural. And one of them was Ravenna. And in Ravenna there were these beautiful churches, but they had been Aryan churches. Because you know, the person who built them was an Aryan sort of governor. And so once the orthodoxy was established in Constantinople, and they sent, I think it was Justinian, sent over um, a group to sort of push out, if you will, the heretics and to make orthodox again the capital, the, you know, the old capital of Ravenna, they had a problem on their hands because they had these beautiful churches with these beautiful mosaics that had been built like heretics and they didn't want to tear them down. So how do you change them? So a lot of times they had these very, very old mosaics even then and they took some of them down and redid them. And so sometimes when you're looking at these very old churches in Ravenna, you're seeing parts that were put together, put there by the Aryans, and sometimes you see parts that were redone by the Catholics. And the, the thing that I, I want to impress upon you, how important Martin was, that in the East, the Eastern Emperor rededicates the church in Ravenna to St. Martin, who had lived in Gaul. And he was really kind of 
And yet his reputation as a Catholic, as someone who resisted Arianism. And so he became sort of um, the hero of these mosaics. And you can see down in the bottom corner, on the left hand, that's the mosaic. And you see on one side are all these holy women saints who are processing towards the altar with crowns to cast before the, the Lord. And on the other side are all these men saints. And, but the first person in the whole line is St. Martin. And so there you see the inspiration for our icon. Right? It's the oldest depiction of St. Martin. And you see in the, the columns that frame it, those columns are taken from the church of Ravenna that's now dedicated to Apollinarius. It had been dedicated to St. Martin. Last slide. So here we have a little bit of, just to give you a sense of, there's the tree, you know, the funny tree that I'm talking about. Like, you know, you cut down the trees and sometimes they would try to drop the trees on him and he would resist. There's the goose. There's the red cape that he presents to the Lord. It's that same image from, um, from Ravenna, from the old mosaic of Ravenna, including some of the flowers. And the columns and the arches are also borrowed from the church in Ravenna. And then, of course, we have our goose. So that's a little bit on this life of St. Martin, and I hope you uh, get to know him as a great guy. Can I take any questions, thoughts? Yes? I don't know. I think, I think it may have just been a color that artists picked when they didn't know. Um, because we do that, right? We decide that Mary should wear blue. You know, you know why we decide that Mary should wear blue? Anybody? Yes? She's the blueprint for our lives. Okay, that's a good one. Yes. I'll tell you that. Blue was the most expensive paint. It was the more expensive than gold. So she got the best. But now we think Mary just walked around with blue all the time. She probably didn't always wear blue, but you know, in our mind, she does. So, because we, as artists and as Catholics over the centuries, want to honor her, and so we put her in the most expensive color. Now, of course, it's no more expensive than any other color, but, but for a long time, blue was almost exclusively reserved for images of the Blessed Virgin Mary because it was so expensive. But I think Hollywood sort of does a lot of things too. I mean, not that the paintings of St. Martin that are 500 years old, they're not Hollywood inspired, but Hollywood sort of puts in our mind that all capes should be red too. You know, we get, we get, we build these traditions even in our own times. Yes? I have often you might have already said this, but how, how come St. Martin is so big that I don't know how many other people that like, I had never really heard anything about I had lost? Yeah, I, 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 I think part of it is because of the Reformation. Um, we name children Benedict now, but for a long time we wouldn't because of Benedict Arnold, right? And I think Martin, we name daughters to you, but we still, we're, you know, we're not going to be very, we don't really want to name men that. And I think with Martin Luther, I think he kind of uh, eclipsed. You know, when people just say Martin, you know, that's bad name because you know, that's a, that's a the name of a man who rebelled against Catholicism. But in fact, he had the name of this great, great saint. But I do think things just get lost, you know. And part of it is our own. You know, we like the saints that we know, and so like we like Saint Pius, Saint Pio, Pio, you know, because we some of us were alive when he was alive. And so we kind of, 
We can't always have the same amount of devotion for the same amount of people. But like St. John had a great devotion. You know, and nowadays we're, we're you know, people, in St. John's case comes and goes and most people don't know that it's even happening, right? But when we were Catholic, those big feasts were huge. But now that we're living in the secular world, you know, it will be, we have different, we lose some of that tradition. So, yes? Just getting back to red, red was an important color for the military. Right. You know, the skies of the uh, blood from wounds. Right. And it's an, it's a, it's a handsome color. And like, who would wear white as a military man? You know, but uh, he was probably part of the very elite guard for the emperor. So, 